Well, listen, folks, thanks so much for the opportunity of being here. I'm grateful that you're here. I know some of you are perhaps being involved in other networks and sessions, and I hope that it's an incredible blessing for you as it has been for so many others uh, who have participated in these kinds of activities through ELF. For some of you, it's the first uh, event perhaps with uh, the European Leadership Forum. This is my 19th year of uh, going to the forum. We started out uh, 19 years ago in Chopron, Hungary, and we did some sessions in ELF in those years, and then we moved over to uh, another area of Hungary before moving into uh, the new situation where we've been for the last several years in uh, near uh, Krakow uh, in, in the country of, uh, of uh, Poland. So it's so great to have you here. Uh, let me give you a little bit of an overview of who it is I am. I think some of you may have been in our, our network and for those uh, that have been in the network, that's gonna be a little repetition, but for those of you that have not, I think you'll find this to be uh, somewhat interesting. But uh, I am uh, live in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. So if you don't have a best friend in Indianapolis, I'm uh, willing to accept your friendship and we would hope that if you're ever into the United States, you can come and visit with us. And, I've given that invitation out to, I don't know how many hundreds of people over the course of the last uh, several years of my life. And uh, we've had a lot of people that have come and stayed with us for a day or so. And it's always been wonderful for us to be able to share with our friends and our neighbors, you know, the work that you do so that they can uh, get the experience of what it is that God's doing in the, in the rest of the world uh, where we all uh, happen to live. So uh, I grew up in the state of Maine, just a little bit of an overview. That's the uh, middle of the northeastern part of the United States. I went to college in Miami, Florida, which is in the southern part of the United States. I went to grad school in 1967 uh, to um, take uh, my uh, master's degree. Uh, in strategic or in uh, public relations, <laughs> public relations, excuse me, uh, in uh, apologetics and uh, theology. Uh, graduated in 1970, started teaching at a small Bible institute uh, for three years, decided that if I was going to stay in education, I needed to get a doctorate. So I came back to the seminary where I graduated a few years earlier. And uh, somehow in the midst of all of this, I ended up doing the work of development. I think most of us made decisions uh, early on, I suspect, uh, in our lives. I think I was a freshman or a sophomore in high school, and somebody says, well, what do you want to do when you grow up? <clears throat> and uh, of course, what did we know we were going to do? I mean, I think most of us didn't really have a clue what we were going to do when we were uh, 15 or 16 years old. But I, uh, it was back in the Apollo era, for those of you that are as old as I am, but uh, I thought, well, it would really be cool to, to be a, an astronaut. And uh, well, I never became an astronaut, but, but the realities are that was a, a bit of my experience. But uh, so I never planned to be a development person. I was, uh, went to seminary to teach, and, and, uh, but I needed a job when I was going through grad school, my, working on my doctorate. And uh, the opportunity was given for me to have a job while I was working. And so I worked in the development department for a number of years uh, as the director of alumni relations. I was getting a full-time salary. I was getting free tuition. And I was told that I could stay as long as I wanted to. Well, I stayed for about nine years. And then I was appointed to be the new vice president for Grace College and Theological Seminary. And part of the role that I was going to do was going to be to organize uh, and to develop and to raise money for our organization. And uh, so that's how I ended up in this position. I've been doing it now for uh, uh, over 50 years, uh, working in the area of organizational development in a variety of different ways. And so uh, that's a little bit about who I am and what it is that I do. But uh, among the things that I do uh, are things uh, related to development. In other words, uh, we talk about development, and let me give you a definition real quickly before we get into the presentation. But uh, <clears throat> I really wanted to give you a definition, and that definition is that development represents the things that we do to build what I call rational relationships with others. That the, the really the, the goal of what it, development is all about is not about raising money. It has very little to do with money. It has very little to do with what you have to say. 
but the reality is are we all know that uh, to the degree that we build relationships, we have the opportunity of really growing relationships with individuals who might become a part of what it is that we do. They become involved in strategic planning in a whole variety of areas in which we minister. But we've been, I've committed a, a life of really training people how to do that. And included among the things that we get involved in is obviously strategic plans. But let me share with you the eight areas of development that basically you have to be concerned about because they all relate to the work that you do. And so the five or eight, the eight areas of development are this, or include these. Number one, you know, fundraising. I suspect that most of you uh, work with organizations that need resources in order to be able to grow the ministry that you are a part of. So I'm sure that that's part of something that's very important to you. But we also need to be involved in recruiting others. And we do it in a variety of different ways, don't we? We recruit volunteers to come alongside and be a part of us. We, we want to, you know, if we're in an educational environment, you might want to recruit students to, to come to your university or your college or whatever the case might be. Uh, we want to engage people uh, who have an interest in what it is we're doing. We want them to come to events and activities and so forth so that they can hear what it is we do and actually know uh, how to go about the process of really growing an organization. So that's very, very important. Uh, the third area is what I call uh, retaining people. We, we don't want to just engage them, but we want to continue to involve them in the context of our ministries. And so there's a whole uh, area of organizational development that focuses on uh, donor retainment, you know, keeping them engaged in what it is that we do. Uh, a fourth area is public relations. I think all of you are basically, whether you know it or not, that you are a representative of the organization that you're a part of. And uh, you need to relate to people as well as all the other folks that work with you, communicating to them what it is that uh, essentially that you're all about. And public relations is a very, very important part of development. You know, a fifth area is development uh, or uh, um, database management. You're working with people and you're working with a lot of people. And so how do you manage that and to grow them into a relationship that basically is going to enable them to be more successful and you to achieve your, the mission to which you've committed yourself. Uh, then you have uh, issues of a strategic planning, which is where, where we're going to go in just a few minutes, uh, because we need to plan for the future, because if we don't, we don't uh, probably get to where we want to go. And so strategic planning has always been a part of the focus of the work of development. Uh, another area uh, is organization. How do you organize to get it done? Most of you are working in probably environments where you're the only person in the office that's doing the work that you're doing. You may work with a group of people that together uh, you are committed to really growing uh, an organization through uh, their continued involvement. But uh, we need to learn how to leverage ourselves. I think the older we get, the more we realize how much uh, there's still yet to do, and we really want to make sure that we move forward in the relationships that we have. Um, so uh, we, need to be, we need to be better organized, and we're gonna talk a little bit about that. And then the final area that you just need to be aware of is, is outcomes. That basically we, we are doing something to accomplish certain outcomes that we want to be consistent to the mission to which we're involved in. So those are the areas that basically are introductory to what it is we're doing. Let's go and, and talk a little bit more about the things that, that cause organizations to fail in planning. Now, before we get into that discussion, let me just say that 90% of all uh, strategic plans fail. Uh, we have a, a goal that we want to achieve. We, we have a plan to achieve that goal. Uh, and yet uh, the average organization, 90% of the average organizations, uh, fail to accomplish what it is that they intended to do through the strategic plan. Now there's a lot of reasons why that might happen and they're probably more relevant today than even ever before. I mean, let's say that we in December were deciding to do a strategic plan to actually uh, grow our organization in 2020. So here in 2019, we're getting all excited. We put together a strategic plan and uh, we tell everybody that this is what it is we're going to do. And then all of a sudden, you know, coronavirus uh, takes over and uh, most of us, our whole world has changed, including the loss of a strategic plan 
because the things that we were planning for, you know, we eventually have come to the conclusion that they're not going to be accomplished. But there's all kinds of other reasons. But the reality is our strategic plans, you know, need to be planned. I mean, obviously, we're not saying that you shouldn't plan, but we want you to do the best that you can with planning for a lot of reasons that we'll explain in just a few moments. There are four core characteristics of highly successful organizations. I've had the privilege of working with literally uh, several thousand organizations all around the world. We have over 3,500 uh, clients just in the United States alone and, and Canada. And so uh, we've had the opportunity of really being at evaluating and assessing uh, what it is that's happening in the world of development. And uh, we've discovered that there are four things that basically characterize organizations that are very highly successful. And the first of those is that they have a mission. They know why they exist. And uh, most uh, organizations, if you're a nonprofit organization in America, and if you want to uh, establish yourself as an organization, you have to present a mission statement that tells the world, for all practical purposes, what it is they're all about. This mission is extremely important. And so sometimes, you know, the mission, you know, because you're just beginning a new organization, you're just kind of thinking this is what it is that you want to do but you're not sure exactly that maybe there's something else that might happen later in terms of the mission. But the mission statement is a statement. In other words, it basically is a statement that is, uh, has a number of clauses in it that base each of those clauses representing a certain aspect of what it is that we do. So let me give you a, uh, an example of a mission statement. Um, I have had the opportunity of working with one of the largest nonprofits in, in the world uh, called Habitat for Humanity. You probably have heard about it, or many of you perhaps have heard about it, you know, in the areas where you live in the world. And uh, this organization basically helps people who've never had a home to have the opportunity of getting a home and being able to establish themselves in a very uh, fruitful way in terms of their own work. So the mission of Habitat for Humanity, listen carefully to it because it has two or four clauses in it that I think are very, very relevant. And, and the mission of Habitat for Humanity goes something like this, that we work in partnership with God and people everywhere from every walk of life, comma, to build and renovate buildings, comma, to, be, to create community, comma, so that people can become all that God intended for them to be. Now that's a mission statement, and I think it's you know quite interesting because it does tell whoever is listening to that that this is what we do as an organization. We we work in partnership with God and people everywhere. Well, now this organization, they are driven by this particular mission statement, and everything that they do is basically committed to the purpose of fulfilling that mission statement. And when things are offered to them in terms of opportunities that don't match up to their mission statement, they discard them because they want to focus primarily on the mission to which they've committed. Now, the other part of that is that they build and renovate homes and everybody that knows about Habitat for Humanity already knows about what it is, the fact that they do in building homes and enabling people to find something that they've never had before. And then they want to build community because they realize that people you know, thrive in community. And so there's a whole effort in terms of what it is that they do, not just in building buildings, but to making sure that people can learn how to live within the context of an environment or a community. And then finally, so that people can become all that God intended for them to be. And that's what they do. That is their mission. And they are uh, adamant in, in making sure that that mission you know, is essentially being accomplished so much that I could say about that because it's so very, very important. But uh, I'd encourage you to create a mission statement if you don't have one. And if you want to evaluate one or if you'd like someone like me to look at it and say, hey, listen, you know, this is really good, but you might want to change this out and the other thing, I'm more than happy to do that. But the realities are your mission is extremely important. And you should hold yourselves accountable to fulfilling that mission. Uh, there's a situation that happened in me that I think you might find to be uh, interesting and maybe even enjoyable. But, but the realities are the president of the organization of which I was a part for several years called me to his office along with the other vice presidents that were involved at the university of which I was a part. He came and we all sat down and 
he began to explain the mission statement to all of us. We all heard it, we all knew about it and so forth, but the realities are he took upon himself the point of saying, okay, here are some things that um, I want you to be mindful of. And he began to quote the mission statement of the organization. He was the third president of the institution of which I was a part. Uh, and he had uh, a lot of experience about what it is that happened in the past. And, and so he wanted us to know where we came from, where we were going, and what it is that we were committed to doing. And so he told us about the mission statement. And we all took notes. And then at the end of the time together, he said to us all, he said, I want you to go back to your offices. And I want you to come back in another week and I want you to tell us what you are going to do in the role that you play in the organization and what it is that you're going to do this year to help us to fulfill this mission. Now stop and think about that. That's really a rather profound statement when you stop and think about it because he was challenging us and actually telling us that he wanted to know in very, very practical terms what they or what I was intended to do or what I was challenged to do to make sure that this mission was being completed in the roles that I was playing in, the, in, in my part of the organization. So I came back uh, about a week later, he sat down with my paper and he looked at it and then he finally said, this is not good enough. And you see, I was talking about, well, we're gonna raise more money, we're gonna do some magazines, we're doing all the kinds of things that basically we do in the area of development. He says, that's not what I want. I want you to tell me, practical terms, how that's going to impact anyone related to this organization. So I went back to my office along with pretty much everybody else. And I did something else. And I went back and he says, well, this is better. And then he said, but I think I want you to do this, that, and the other thing. And so he says, come back in another week and we'll get this thing finalized. And so I did. And finally he looked at it and he said, this is really great. This is exactly what I want you to do. You're responsible for getting this done. And I want everyone in your team to do the same thing that I just asked you to do. And so he asked me to sign this document. He signed it, he put it into my uh, folder. And, uh, and I went back to my office because I had 12 or 15 guys that were working for me and gals. I said, okay, you know, you're the annual fund director. You're the guy that's doing missions, whatever it was you know, that they were responsible for. You're the guy that's involved in public relations. And I want to know in practical terms what it is that you are going to do this year. This next year, I want to know in practical terms, what it is that you're going to do this year to make sure that this mission is going to be completed in your area of responsibility. So they did the same thing that I just did. You know, I came back with them and I said, okay, let me see what, what you've come up with. And, and sometimes they were good, sometimes they were bad, but I probably said, go back and come back and let's, let's look at it again in just a, another week. And so we did it again and we did the same thing. And then finally we signed off, he signed off, I signed off and the president signed off that this is what we were going to do. And this is what we were going to do this year. Everyone, now let me tell you, we had probably 130, 150 people that worked uh, at the university and every single one, whether they were the, the uh, uh, faculty members, whether they were the, the teachers that, uh, or the uh, people that were doing, uh, various activities uh you know that happen in universities the the custodian you know he had to fill it out the person that answered the phone they had to finish it out and do the same thing and virtually every single person in the organization this is the exciting thing about it is that every single person in the organization had to do the same thing now imagine if that were to happen in your organization now you have people working together in community you know, sometimes in education, you say, well, the faculty are the most important people. Well, the realities are without the other aspects of what bring the faculty to the point where they can do what it is they want to do. If they weren't there, it wouldn't get done. But now they are taking recognition of all of these folks and so forth. And, and it really just makes a huge, huge difference. And it really changed our whole organization. And now that same university, which I'd been a part for this for so long, they continue to do that every single year. We're going to make sure that, you know, we want to evaluate what it is that we've done. We want to make sure that we're doing better in the next year. And we're holding everybody, everybody, every single person accountable to what it is that they have committed themselves to do. And if you do that, you're going to have a very successful organization. Well, let's move on and talk about the next step of this. And that's the word vision. 
Now vision, you know, if you want to use an equal sign, okay, so we're going to make this a little mathematical, but for the point of this statement, I think it probably will be clearer to you that vision equals the equal sign, vision equals mission accomplished. In other words, we're striving to accomplish something. And that is a vision for where we want to be as we grow our organization in the future. You know, I've always been challenged by visionaries. I don't know about you, but I've always been uh, around people who were visionaries, you know, strong people who really believed in what it is that uh, the organization represented. They have a vision that goes beyond anything else that other people might have. But visionaries are people that I have been motivated from by the, I think, all of my life. And one of the visionaries that I was, have been so impacted with by my, in my life was a gentleman by the, the name of uh, Bill Bright. Now, some of you would recognize that name immediately because Bill Bright was the president and founder of an organization called Campus Crusade for Christ, now Crew. And, uh, and Bill, you know, had a vision. And he sat down in 1978 and was talking with a group of people. And he says at the end of the conversation, I want to make sure that by the year 2000, and remember this is 1978, I want to make sure by the year 2000 that 4.3 billion people will have the opportunity of seeing the Jesus film in their own language by the year 2000. Now you can imagine the quietness in the room <laughs> because they're all looking at each other and everybody's kind of thinking, what did he just say? And so somebody raises their hand and says, what was that number again, Bill? And he says, yeah, it was billion with a B and uh, the person just kind of looked back and looked around to the person sitting next to him and, and they were kind of whispering among themselves, well, that's everybody that's on planet earth. And it was the um, um, population of, uh, in 1978, the population of earth uh, at, at, that particular, at that particular time. And, uh, and then somebody looked at, you know, there's usually always a group of people that are the uh, ones that are kind of the budget keepers and all the other things. And one of the guys in the accountant group said, uh, well, uh, do you have any idea what that's going to cost, Bill? And Bill says, no, I don't have any idea whatsoever. And uh, somebody else looked and says, well, do you care? And he says, no, I really care a great deal. And that's the reason. And we must do this. That launched the largest single initiative of fundraising and, and successful uh, achievement of a goal uh, in the history of the organization. And we had 22 years from 78 to 2000. So if you're looking at uh, the next slide here, which is on the left-hand side, you see the strategic plan. You see the bottom is the mission. The vision is where it is we want to go. The strategic plan is what's going to take us there. And so if you were looking at this and you were looking at it the way that Bill Bright was looking at it, there were 22 steps from 1978 all the way to 2000. And during that period of time, we wanted to get to a point where we could get, uh, have the, uh, the Jesus film available to anyone on the planet of Earth, uh, the 4.3 billion people that lived there uh, at the time. And so the strategic plan was very, very important. Now that's kind of exciting. I think you probably can look at that and say, "Ah, oh, that's pretty neat. You know, that's uh, actually, it's quite interesting. And, and uh, but you know, you could have all three of those things and still fail as an organization. And that's very important to remember because it's gonna be an, in, you know, a significant point to where it is that we wanna go here in this discussion. Because the realities are, if you don't have the resources to accomplish what it is that you wanna do in the strategic plan, the realities are this all, this all collapses. In other words, you could say we want to have, you know, we want to raise a million dollars, but we don't have uh, about a hundred thousand dollars in the bank. You know, you're almost setting yourself up for disaster. And so the fourth part of this pyramid is what I call the development plan. You have to have in place the resources that you need in order to be able to grow the organization that you've committed yourself to. In other words, you, on the development plan of side of things, there, there are really four or five resources. I mean, obviously we need you know, God's help to do what it is we're doing. And you need money and you need people. Uh, these are all things that are important if we're going to be effective in achieving the goal. Now, the point is, one of the reasons why 90% of the organizations that you know, get involved in strategic plan fail is because they have a, a dream 
which is a inspiring and everything else is really wonderful about it, but they don't have the resources. And, and because they don't have the resources, the plan can't be executed. And so keep that in the back of your mind. I think that image, you know, explains in, in you know, extremely simple ways, you know, how an organization is going to achieve success. Now, let me just share with you some thoughts in terms of why strategic plans fail. Strategic plans fail for the most part because they're created in a vacuum. Uh, I've met a lot of very interesting people over the course of my lifetime, and uh, many of them were visionaries. And in fact, I like to think of myself as a visionary at some level, but certainly not at the level of a guy like uh, Bill Bright or uh, Millard Fuller, who was the president, the founder of uh, 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 Habitat for Humanity. But these guys were were visionaries, and uh, but uh, there are others, you know, that get uh, you know kind of excited about you know the future. And I, you probably know some of these folks who uh, maybe work as colleagues in the organization of which you're a part. And uh, you know, some of them will come and they'll say, you know, boy, wouldn't it be something if we could just uh, you know change this country? And uh, and and certainly that would be a laudable goal and it would be one that we would hope that people would have the opportunity of being a part of uh, but the realities are you know sometimes it's just like yeah you're going to do this and it's going to cost us 40 million dollars and how much did we raise last year well we had a hundred thousand dollars last year or whatever the case type might be but a, certainly a gap between the other the, the, the larger number uh, versus the smaller number and so the strategic people go out and say okay well we're just going to trust god for this and believe me i believe in trusting god I mean, I've spent, you know, 76 years of my life, you know, working and helping organizations to become what it is that they want to be. I mean, I, I didn't start that at 76 years ago when I was born, but, but the realities are the whole focus of my ministry has been, you know, how can we really grow an organization that's going to make a difference in the context of the world in which we live? But there are a lot of people that say, okay, well, we're just going to trust God for this and and then everybody gets really excited about it, but when nothing happens, then a lot of the excitement begins to diminish, doesn't it? And, and people get a little bit more discouraged and perhaps a bit frustrated and so forth. So sometimes we're making plans that are kind of created in a vacuum. They're just, you know, not realistic, but at the same time, you know, it gets people exciting at least initially, but oftentimes there's disappointment that follows. Now, sometimes you get the wrong planners. Uh, if you, if, if you want to make a, a big mistake, then I'm going to share one with you that you probably will find to be uh, perhaps a, a bit amusing at one level, but uh, certainly frustrating on the others. But let's say that, you know, we're going to start something. You know, we say, well, we've got this great vision and, and uh, you know, we're needing some help to do this. And we need to get some help here. And so you're thinking about the help. You know, what can I get here? Who can I get to help me with this organization? And then uh, it says, we need some volunteers. Well. Here's a reminder. If somebody is the first one to jump up and say, I want to be one, I want to be one, I want to be one, then be aware. Because typically what happens, you get the wrong planners. You see, you get somebody who's got a, uh, an agenda, a hidden agenda that you may not even know about. And all of a sudden they're saying, you know, this is what it is that I want to do. I've always wanted to do something like this. And you've just given me the opportunity. And you said, yes, 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 I want to do that then you probably get some challenges to face. You want to get the right planners. You want to get people who basically know the organization, who understand the organization. Uh, if you have a, a strategic plan team, that should include uh, certainly the board of directors and certainly the administrative staff of the organization of which you're a part. But just uh, be careful about off offering anyone the opportunity who might have an interest uh, to become a part of that. You may want to engage them in some level of conversation, but not giving them the authority that they need to make the changes that might be uh, devastating. Here, here's another one. You fail to count the cost. We've kind of referred to that already, haven't we? Uh, I I've, have just been involved in a number of projects. I've been actually involved in a lot of stuff in Eastern and Central Europe and Africa and Russia over the last number of years. And... Uh, and, and basically, again, people with a great vision, but they don't have the resources to try to make sure that it's going to be accomplished. And so 
uh, again, you probably have been involved in some kind of a, a strategic plan, and I'd like to have you share some of your own experiences as we close to become close to the end of this, where you can just kind of share with us what it is that you've experienced. Because uh, I was in a university here oh, probably seven or eight years ago, and I was asked to facilitate a strategic planning uh, program for their organization the university's organization. I came in a day early and I uh, walked over to a table where most of the faculty members were there and we sat down together and uh, we're talking about, you know, what was going on at the university and so forth. And then somebody at the other end of the table said, well, what are you here to do, Mr. Twombly? And I said, well, uh, I'm here to facilitate the strategic planning process. And people started laughing. And, and, and it wasn't laughing hysterically. It was just kind of smiling and, and, uh, and I said, well, what, what's this all about? And they said, oh, you know, we, we just uh, uh, had a strategic plan. I think it was in, back in 2017. And, and, uh, and, and uh, it just never, you know, came to reality. It never came to realization. And then somebody else stands up and says, well, you know, you thought 2017 was bad. You should assume 2015. And they just went back, I mean, about five strategic plans backwards. And none of them succeeded. And so you could almost experience the, the uh, concern and uh, you know, their lack of enthusiasm for what it is that I was supposed to do in, in, in this particular event that I was asked to facilitate. So we, they, we've got to take consideration of the cost because if we don't, people are gonna be disappointed. And then here's the, another one, which is the last one I wanna talk about, but that is that the strategic, the strategic plan is outdated before it even starts. Uh, it used to be, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, you know, that uh, you could plan uh, with some level of uh, understanding, you know, what could be done over a relatively uh, larger period of time, maybe three or four years. Sometimes uh, we saw some campaigns or some strategic plans go to 10 to 15 years, which is really totally unrealistic because everything changes, as we clearly know. I mean, uh, technology has changed so much that it, it's almost hard to even keep up with it. And it, with this, when you think you are, then all of a sudden something else is coming out that you are finding is even better than what it is that you had in the past. I think the greatest example of what it is we're experiencing now is one that basically, uh, you know, we are all aware of. I mean, all of us in 2019 had aspirations in terms of what we were going to do in 2020 until about February. And then between February, March, and April, and the early part of May, you know, the whole economy of the world has been impacted. You never could have predicted that. And certainly if you created a strategic plan in December, you're not nearly anywhere near where it is you want to be and probably will never take place. So the strategic plan needs to be done. And so what I suggest is that you don't do, you know, a, a, a long-term strategic plan. Because if you do, you're undoubtedly going to experience, you know, what it is that uh, you might not want to experience. So I would suggest that you use more short-term plans. Uh, it is wiser to do a series of short plans than one large one. And so, and the reason for that is that you, you can contone it, contain it only by virtue of the fact of time. Um, there are four areas in which we do development. This is kind of just an, an assignment, not an assignment, but just a overview here of some of the things that we do because all of us do development different ways. And so here are the four ways in which typically we communicate and engage others, uh, especially on the fundraising aspects of what it is that strategic plan involves. But um, you know, the one thing that we do is we do a lot of projects. We recommend to our clients to be involved in projects. Now, by what I mean by a project is something that is short, term uh, in its implementation. In other words, uh, it might need that uh, you have a special need in your perhaps 25, 50, maybe $100,000, maybe even more, depending upon the size of your organization. But it's something that needs to be done that you couldn't budget because it was something beyond the, the budget budgeted plan for the organization for that particular year. But it's something that's desperately needed and we want to get it involved. So typically we'll say, well, why don't you create a project and make this, you know, we'll call it, we'll give it a name and we'll provide people maybe three to five months, you know, to uh, 
participate financially in, in supporting this particular project. So we're giving them the opportunity to amortize for all practical purposes a gift. So let's say you, you want to give a gift of $150 and you want to do it over you know, five months. Well, then the realities are you could make that contribution and enough people doing the same thing can really enable you to do things relatively quickly and to be able to express excitement and involvement you know, very early on. In other words, we did it. We said we were going to do it. We did it. It was successful. Let's celebrate it and let's go on. And so I would recommend, you know, a series of plans, uh, small projects, engaging, you know, a lot of people in the opportunity of being able to be involved and, and do that. You're going to be far more successful and you'll lose a lot of that frustration that basically is associated when something doesn't happen when we expect it to. All right, here's another one. You can't keep up with technology. I mean, I can't keep up with it and I'm really old, but the realities are I can't almost remember what it is that I did yesterday. But um, the realities are you can't keep up with technology. So don't even, I mean, I'm not suggesting that you not try that, but the realities are if you're, if you're planning in a long way to do something, technology may enhance it at one level, but it can also discourage things in accomplishing what it is that we want to do, depending upon what it is that we are going to plan to do. So we're going to go a little quickly here. You, can main, you can't maintain enthusiasm over the long term unless you, know, you have success along the way that you're celebrating constantly. Okay. Here's a third area or another area. You must manage attitudes. Now, uh, discouragement can lead to cynicism and encouragement leads to euphoria. Now, here's one of my favorite uh, continuums. And I think you might find this to be pretty interesting because you're on the, you're on the list. You're on the mark here. So uh, I call this the attitude continuum. Everybody on the attitude continuum is somewhere between cynicism and euphoria. Okay, now you see it there on the line. Over in the far right, you see cynicism. On the far left, you see euphoria. Now, if you didn't see any other blocks, then the realities are, I would say, if I were just talking to a group with, this, with only those, those things, the two dimensionals, the dimensions, cynicism and euphoria. And if I were to say to you, okay, you know, in relationship to your, the church that you worship with, you know, where are you on the attitude continuum between euphoria and cynicism? Forget about what's underneath there. Where would you put the dot? You know, where are we as an organization in terms of uh, what it is that we're talking about in terms of the mission of the organization versus what it is that appears to be reality as best as we understand it. You know, where would you put that little dot there? You know, where would you do um, anything, you know, as it relates to it? Imagine, you know, coming to a new church, all right? And so the, the, the big diamond in the middle is where someone is just kind of, you know, maybe they came to your church for the first time, okay? And there you are. And um, you're really excited. Let's say that you came to this church, people were very kind to you and so forth. And the pastor says, we sure want you to be involved in the organization. We think that you're, you have the tools and the resources and the passion to really help us grow our ministry and so forth. And so you're really kind of feeling up, aren't you, in terms of, boy, this is great. And then maybe uh, a few weeks later, you never hear it from anybody and the pastor says, you know, don't worry about it. We'll talk about that later or whatever the case might be. And they become discouraged and you've been, been discouraged. And, uh, and so they're starting to move down towards uh, what I call the South area of the continuum towards cynicism. They, they get a little discouraged. Now that's one that's the easiest one to deal with, quite frankly, because what unfortunately we don't do is we don't tell people what to expect because they have expectations of what it is that they could do and how they could be involved and all of those things that we just talked about. But the realities are, you know, nobody was ever telling them them. So they become a little bit discouraged because no one was talking to them. Well, eventually, if you don't deal with that, then you get a little frustrated. Now, you know what frustration looks like. You've seen it, you've experienced it. I'm so frustrated and you kind of say, you know, and, and then basically you say, well, why are you so frustrated? Well, because they, they're not doing anything. If they only did this, and they can always give the illustration what, why they're frustrated, because somebody was not doing what it is that they thought they should be doing. And so they get frustrated and a little bit uh, upset about everything. Well, if you continue to go on towards cynicism, the next step is apathy. 
right? I mean, apathy, you know, expresses the attitude, well, <clears throat> if they don't cover, they don't care, why should I? They just kind of shrug their shoulders and, and they go to somebody else in the church or somebody else in the organization and say, hey, get used to it. This is the way it is. Well, if you continue to let that go, you know, you kind of cynicism. And cynicism, you know, is uh, pretty bad. It's the last person in the back seat of the congregation who basically is kind of throwing walk throwing uh, rocks to the uh, somebody up uh, ahead of him and, and basically saying, you know something, nothing's going to be different. Just accept it. You've been there, you've known people like that, you've experienced people like that, and you may be some one of those people right now, and you have every justification of saying, I am frustrated, I'm discouraged, and you know why. Well, now, there's another sexual way that that could go, okay? You have encouragement. You know, I'm encouraged. I mean, I, you know, the pastor came in. They told me the opportunities that I could be involved. I'm working with two different groups of people. We're having good discussions. I'm a part of a small group. All of those things, they become, you know, they start to get encouraged. And then they go a little bit further and say, well, you know, this is really good. Now, uh, and I've got a lot of hope that this is a place where we can serve. We can be used to the Lord. We can be a part of a community that we really believe in and, it makes, and we believe we can make a difference. And so they, they begin to have some hope. Well, then, you know, they might be enthusiastic along the way, you know, where they're saying, you know, this is just about the greatest church that I've ever been involved in. These people understand they're actively involved. They really do want us to be a part of what it is that we're doing. Uh, so they get really enthusiastic. And then it goes to euphoria. I've not seen too many people in euphoria, but the realities are some of you probably have in many other ways. Now, the thing to remember is this. There is a propensity, and you, you, I'm sure, would agree with me. There's a propensity of us to go to cynicism because we don't want to go and be hurt because we've been hurt before in the past. In other words, I've been hurt. You know, I was encouraged for a while, and all of a sudden, everything that dropped out. And so there, there, there's a propensity to move towards cynicism, despite the fact that you may not want to. But the only way you can move from cynicism to euphoria, it's a short journey, I mean a long journey, is by having success. When people have success, they become encouraged. And so this is why strategic planning is so very important, the kind of strategic planning, because virtually, you know, if you have failed strategic plans, basically you're not only getting the plan not done, but you've you've impacted the attitudes of the people that you need in order to be able to grow an organization. So this is why I suggest that you take smaller projects, have, make sure that you have a likelihood of success. When that success comes, we're gonna celebrate it, we're gonna enjoy it, we're going to have the joy of being a part of it, and, and, and things are going to begin to happen, and if that happens, you know, more often than not than the realities are, your organization is going to succeed.